This is really an exciting time in CLL research. Obviously, there's lots of new drugs coming forward, new BTK inhibitors, BCL2 antagonists, P3 kinase inhibitors, and other mechanisms that really hadn't previously been explored in CLL. And as well, I think that our um, knowledge of genomics and the um, advent of really very easy and quick um, sequencing has helped us to really understand some of the mechanisms of resistance, which will definitely help us moving forward. So when we find that somebody is relapsing from one of these agents, if we can figure out why they're relapsing, we may be able to even find targeted therapies that are more likely to work in that patient population. So what we've seen so far with ibrutinib is that when patients with relapse disease do relapse on ibrutinib with CLL, the outcomes are not very good. So we've seen a, a overall survival of about 14 months in patients after they relapse on ibrutinib. Um, however, now that we know why people are relapsing, I think that we're going to be much better able to develop a targeted or a tailored therapy for those patients who do relapse. We've mainly looked at the BTK inhibitor ibrutinib in CLL, and the incidence of resistance is very low, especially early on, and it does increase a little bit over time. Um, we've seen two distinct patterns of resistance to ibrutinib in CLL, and one is through Richter's transformation, which is transformation from the CLL to a more aggressive lymphoma, and the other is through progression of CLL itself. So Richter's transformation we tend to see occur earlier on, and usually within the first two years of taking the drug, and we tend to see CLL progressions later, generally after a year of therapy. So in our series at Ohio State, we have 308 patients, and we have a follow-up of a, almost three years, about 33 months right now. And we've seen at one year, the rate of CLL progression is less than 1%, and the rate of Richter's transformation is 4.6%. And when we go out to about four years, the incidence of CLL progression increases to about 15% and the risk of Richter's transformation increases to about 10%. These incidences are actually much lower than we see with any other therapies in CLL at this time, at least what's been reported. You know, some of the newer agents may have as good of um, response durations, but the follow-up on those is shorter. But compared to a standard chemoimmunotherapy or another standard therapy for relapse to refractory CLL, um, these are much better. We've identified two distinct mechanisms for um, relapse from ibrutinib in CLL, and the first is through mutations in Bruton's tyrosine kinase itself, and we've seen in um, about 80% of patients so far a cysteine to serine mutation in BTK, and what that does is it decreases the binding affinity of BTK4 ibrutinib and also changes ibrutinib from an irreversible inhibitor to a reversible inhibitor. Um, the second mechanism that we've seen is through mutations in PLC gamma 2, and PLC gamma 2 is the kinase immediately downstream of BTK, and we've characterized a few of these different mutations and found them all to be gain-of-function mutations in the presence of IgM stimulation. So although BTK is still blocked by brutinib, the pathway is turned on downstream. So th together these two account for about 90 percent of the resistance that we've at least seen. Um, there are certainly people who relapse with different mechanisms and a lot of work is being undertaken to try to figure out what those are. Right now, there's not really a standard way to test for resistance in everybody outside of the normal way that we look at CLL response and progression. So generally, we'll see people on ibrutinib at least monthly for the first six months, and then generally every three months, as long as they're doing very well after that. And you know, we'll do a standard physical exam, a CBC. Occasionally, CT scans can be performed, especially if you're concerned about resistance or think that the patient might have a complete response. Um, and if we tend to see that people's lymphocyte count is going up a little bit or lymph nodes seem to be larger on exam, we would just follow them more closely after that. And one thing that we've found is that um, resistance to ibrutinib is more common in people who have a complex stimulated karyotype at baseline, at least among the patients with relapsed and refractory disease. So I think that that actually is something that could help clinicians a lot, is that those are patients who you really need to watch out for um, that are going to be at more risk for developing resistance. As we've seen that it's actually very rare in people who don't have a complex karyotype. ACP196 is a second generation BTK inhibitor, and so it actually binds BTK a little bit more tightly than ibrutinib and appears to be a little bit more selective than ibrutinib. Um, the results with that in the phase one study have been really outstanding as well in relapsed and refractory disease. Um, and I think it just remains to be seen which of those two BTK inhibitors is going to be better in the long term, but they haven't been compared head to head.